the offer spectrum, right? Because every offer falls somewhere on this spectrum. And then we're basically gonna like map out a couple of these different options and talk about how I would respond to these offers if I was representing the seller, how we would respond to these offers if we're representing the buyer, right? I'll give you guys a couple of like actual offers that I I've submitted one today that we think is hopefully gonna go into escrow. Um, we'll talk about that. It's a $9 million Walgreens. In Stockton, California. And then I had a client over the weekend get a $3 million offer on his single family residence in Las Vegas. Both of these offers are very, very different. <laughs> There's a lot to consider with the second one. So we'll kind of like run through each of those. But if you guys remember, I said we left off saying that like all this stuff is on a spectrum, right? Typically, the highest price with the least amount of contingencies is willing to play ball with the seller. It's going to give the seller options and the fastest close is not coming on one offer, right? Usually the highest price is coming from an owner user, someone who's gonna go live there, right? So if you're selling single family, right? The highest price that someone's gonna pay for the single family is almost always, right? Gonna come from a family. Right? It's gonna be someone who's gonna go actually move in and live there, right? And families, right, typically get loans, right? So they're not going to be non contingent, right? They're more like over here. So let's say they are the highest price, right? Yeah, but they're, they're definitely going to have contingencies in here because we think they're going to get a loan, right? And what do we know about families? Like, are they okay closing in six months or? Eight months. No, they want, no, they want to fast. They want to. They want to close quickly, right? So they're going to have a fast close, which could be good. Right? We'll talk about instances in, in which it's not, right? And then um, I wrote up on the board unilateral outs. That would be an example of something that's really bad for a buyer or a seller when the other party has all these options to like get out of escrow or they can cancel or they can get their money back for whatever reason. Right. We'll talk, we'll actually talk about a couple of them, right? It's standard, right, that um, buyers have a unilateral out in escrow, right? So what goes into escrow that the buyers, it's like they're signing good faith that they're going to move forward. Deposit. The deposit, right? Their earnest money deposit. So I said last time, like, okay, let's, these are all a moving piece. So if they send the deposit in, right, we've got the buyer and the seller, right? And then down here, we've got escrow. In practice, escrow is not supposed to be partial to either the buyer or the seller, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're just not, they're not supposed to, right? In reality, a lot of times the escrow officer is chosen and selected by the sellers. So sometimes in reality, you have a, the selling agent or the listing agent is gonna have maybe a little bit more information about where the other parties are at, right? But practically speaking, escrow is supposed to be 100% third party. So we came up with this example that, um, the, let's say the family is gonna buy a $2 million home, right? It's standard that the earnest money deposit is 3% or $60,000 in this case, right? So what's gonna happen? We sign the RPA, 
Everyone says, yay, let's open escrow. Great, your offer got accepted. The seller's are like, hey, we've chosen to accept this offer. Congratulations, right? And the buyer's gonna put their $60,000 into escrow. Okay. And then now what? Once we've opened escrow, bless you, the sellers lost all of their power. They don't get to, if the buyers want to just follow the timelines appropriately and they're going to pay the same amount of money that they went to escrow, the sellers can't do anything to hold this up. Anything legally. Okay. But we have this big looming thing in escrow. And it always comes down to an inspection contingency, right? I'm not gonna say always, but usually what we're talking about here is a request for repairs. So we go into escrow at $2 million, the buyer sends in their $60,000, right? It's a good sign, escrow's holding this money. The purpose of the EMB, right, is to, it's like basically security for the seller to know that the buyer is not gonna mess with that, right? This doesn't contractually belong to the seller until what happens? Not closing, contractually it'll belong to the seller when they go non-contingent. So when they waive the contingencies for inspection, appraisal maybe in this case, and finances. So this is the big one. And, and it typically comes down to the request for repairs. For any reason that the buyer decides not to move forward with the transaction inside of the inspection contingency, then they can cancel and they're supposed to get their $60,000 back. Okay, as long as they have this inspection. Okay. Now, on the flip side, what if it, we check these all off? They all get waived, right? And now this buyer is non-contingent in escrow with their $60,000. Contractually, it's supposed to belong to the seller. Okay. And remember I said, contractually, the buyer should be able to get it all back, right? But remember, escrow is supposed to just be a third party person. They're not supposed to do anything unless both sides agree to it, right? So it contractually belongs to the buyer while it's in escrow, right? And while they have their contingencies, once they become non contingent, it contractually belongs to the seller. But escrow is not supposed to send this $60,000 anywhere until. What? Until they have mutual acceptance from the buyer and from the seller. So the 60 grand stays in escrow until someone, until the buyer and seller agree that escrow can send it somewhere else. Without the contingencies or with the contingencies and everything goes through? Even with the contingencies. Always be the mutual. Yep, yep. They, they need to mutually agree for escrow to send it. And the only instance in which escrow may not send it back is if one party doesn't agree, right? Then that's why we have all that stuff in the contract about mediation and arbitration, liquidated damages, right? Because what if I'm the buyer and I go through the inspection, I find something wrong with the foundation and I say, hey, look, we're not moving forward, not dealing with this anymore. You know, there's bees in the basement. My kids are allergic to bees. Like, I want out. The seller still needs to agree to release this money back to the buyer. How's your contingency removed? Even before contingency is removed. So no matter what, they just always have to they agree have to, agree. to get the money, keep the money, yep. or whatever. They have to agree. Have to agree. Yep, they have to agree. Okay. So in practice, whenever the buyer cancels escrow inside of these contingencies, right? They're supposed to get the money back, and they 99% of the time get agreement from the seller to give them their money back. Okay. But this is an important part to think about is that contractually, something, right, in practice and reality, sometimes something else. 
right? And once this money's in escrow, right, as the seller's agent, you want them to go non-contingent as quickly as possible without issue, right? You want, to, you want them to get through their inspection contingency, get the appraisal and the financing contingencies done, right? The reason that this inspection contingency is so important is because this is unilateral and it's on the buyer's side. If the buyer decides that they want to back out, they can't, right? As part of their inspection contingency. But the buyer, once they waive that, is not the buyer should not be backing out of escrow because of and if, if an appraisal comes in at the number that we wanted, so we're buying it at $2 million. If the property appraises for $2 million, then the buyer is supposed to move forward. And the buyer can't decide to just bail after the inspection contingency is there. But did that further say it's at 1.8? Then the buyer can back out if they want. Yeah. Okay. And that's why we're going to talk about this. It's all on a spectrum, right? So what if we're looking at offers, right, from this family, and it comes in, they have an inspection contingency, and they don't have an appraisal contingency. Once we waive this inspection, <coughs> the only reason that the buyer is not supposed to move forward is if something bad happens with their loan, right? They don't qualify for some way, shape, or form, right? Because the appraisal, if you don't have that contingency, these contingencies are synonymous with outs, right? Like, what are the different ways that the buyer or the seller can get out of the contract if they want to, right? So these are really just outs. We've got an inspection out, right? Once you cross that off, that's not a way for the buyer to back out, right? Once the appraisal, if they submitted this offer without the appraisal contingency, then it's only really gonna come down to their finance. So if you're representing the list side and you get an offer for $2 million and they send this in and it all looks good and we negotiate a request for repairs, which we're gonna cover at length here in a bit, and they waive their inspection contingency. We should know as a listing agent, as long as the financing is good, it's gonna go through, that the buyer will have to perform, okay? So we talked about the only remedy that sellers have once you get into escrow is what? Invoke that to uh, send something, what is it? There is something that you sent. Uh, so sellers have all the power before you get into escrow. They get to decide all the terms. They don't have to accept any. Notice to perform? Yeah. Okay. So the only remedy that sellers have if they feel like the buyers are screwing around or if they're asking for too much money, the only remedy they have is their super point. Okay? That's, that's all a seller can do. As long as the buyer is sticking to their timelines and is willing to pay the amount of money that they agreed upon in escrow, that's all a seller can do is send that their super point. Okay. Sorry, notice to perform. Perform. Yeah, perform. Means you, this is a notice, a letter says that you need to stick to the timelines that we agreed upon in the contract. Okay. So if we get this offer from the family for $2 million, what do we need to see before we accept these terms? We look at it, they're going to send in 60 grand. Okay. So when we're representing buyers, we always want to see proof of funds. I got a proof of funds this morning on a development site in Beverly Hills. Okay. The proof of funds is from, I'm just going to call it company LLC. But the name on the offer this morning was Builder LLC. Problem? Yes. Right? I need to know that this person <laughs> who's supposed to be buying it, right, has the money and, and not this other company that has the money, right? In the last class, I gave an example of someone I was working with purchased the property and it was when the market was insane. It was in Encino, it was hot. It's like big, flat lot. It was just big, massive homes. Like, I think it was like a 
50 yard swimming pool is this massive, he's like exactly what you would have wanted to buy at the start of the market, right? And he ended up using his father's proof of funds, right? That he submitted in. They just looked at the last name, thought, oh, maybe the dad's gonna buy it, while he secured a hard money loan. So in that instance, we did not have an appraisal contingency. We did not have financing contingency, but we did have an inspection. So what if it would have had a price at a cheaper price? Did, Why would it have been appraised? We didn't have an appraisal contingency or a financing contingency. So, then, you know, so no appraiser is supposed to go there. No. If the listing agent wasn't asleep on the job, she would have realized that the father was not the buyer of the home. The buyer was on the contract. The father provided the proof of funds, right? And then what happened was we ended up with a seven day inspection contingency. But remember I said the only remedy that sellers have once you get into escrow is the notice to perform. We knew that we were gonna get this on the seventh day because there's a hot market. There's a lot of competing offers. But we didn't get our notice to perform until day nine on this property. You get like two extra days, right? Yep, two business days. So nine days, right? We ended up with 11 actual days for our inspection contingency. Now, this agent that I was working with and purchasing this home for himself learned this in a in a deal that I was working on. I was representing the seller and I said, we have to send this notice to perform because this person's starting to screw around, the deposit's not in here. We need to get, we need to save face with our client, make sure that they're sticking to these timelines. So he knew how this worked and he knew that we were gonna mess around. And we went back for a second inspection and he got an appraiser in there for his hard money lender. So the listing agent made a bunch of mistakes. One, they let, Someone go into escrow as a buyer with proof of funds from a different person. Don't do that, right? The second thing was when you have all these cash offers at the super hot property in Encino, she should have put someone in a backup position, right? And then the third thing that she should have done and that I would have done, which is a little pushy. Remember I said like, this is the only thing they have. Agents don't like doing this. But I would have sent this seven day inspection contingency. I would have sent the notice to perform. It's an NBP notice for the buyer to perform on day six. Oops, day six. You can legally send it two days before the con inspection contingency is up. And in the residential community, this is not a popular thing to do to send a notice to perform, right? Because they think the buyer's agents and the buyers think you're using this like we're going to kick you out of escrow. That's not what it does. It just gives the seller the ability to cancel escrow. And there's a big difference there, right? In the multifamily community, for people that have inspection contingencies, this is very popular to do. They'll send it as legally as fast as they can so that if they're messing around and arguing with requests for repairs, right, or inspections or anything like that, that the seller can cancel from the moment that um, the inspection contingency is up. In a lot of commercial forms, not really for like multifamily in LA, but in a lot of commercial forms and almost every other product, these contingencies are referred to as passive instead of active. So in residential contracts like the RPA, when you go to waive your inspection contingency, the buyer has to sign it, right? When you waive your appraisal contingency, the buyer has to sign it, financing, sign it. And then still after all of this, there's an all encompassing contingency removal that the buyer needs to sign that makes the deposit go non contingent basically. Right. But in the commercial world, these timelines typically expire. 
So if day eight comes on a seven day inspection contingency and you're purchasing an office building, that's waived, it's gone. That's, that's it. No notice, there's no notice, there's still a notice to perform, but on the, but on the buyer side, for most commercial buildings or properties that you purchase, the contingencies automatically expire. They lapse. They don't, you don't need to get something signed. So if you're going to do a commercial deal, you want a car form. If you're doing commercial, they'll huff and fuss, right? You need a car form because car forms have active contingencies. There's something that you have to do to remove the contingency, right? And AIR forms, I touched on this last time, right? These are passive. The AIR form is the preferred form for commercial real estate, right? So if you are dealing with an AIR form, you're looking at a commercial property, make sure you're following these contingencies very closely. Yes. Uh, the AIR, what does that stand for? I don't even know. American Industrial something, something. I can even tell you. Okay. It's a national form. Okay. Instead of car forms, they're just for California. Because lawsuits are so pro like prominent in California, that the state finally said, "Look, our standardized forms are going to have active contingencies for all of these." So back to our family, right? When you're submitting offers from the buyer, you want as much unilateral outs, you want as many contingencies as you can. You want long close, you want long timelines. Right? Sellers want short timelines, high prices, non contingent, money released to them. Right? So remember, I said at the end of contingencies, contractually, when there's no contingencies left and non contingent, contractually, the money belongs to the seller. But it's not actually the sellers, it's not in their hands until escrow sends it there. You remember, it means mutual acceptance for escrow to send the money to the seller. Right? So if we're looking at our offer spectrum, and we're working with a client who's in a hurry to sell something, should they expect the highest price? Probably not. Right? Should they expect the fastest close? Probably not, right? So every deal falls somewhere like this, or it's over there, or it's over here. You're typically not ending up with all of the best terms when you're selling a property and if you're selling it fast, right? So when you sit down and you talk to your clients and you're working with buyers or sellers, I'm still a huge proponent of like front end loading and everything. Right, spend a lot of time with them so they're informed and comfortable before we get into these crunch time windows. Right? We're going to talk about request for repairs here in a second, but help them understand the difference in purchase price when they get an all cash, non contingent offer from a developer. It's not going to be the highest price that they can expect to get from a family, right, who's going to have all of these different contingencies and. Um, inspection timelines and loans, like for them to purchase it, right? A lot of sellers, as a result of the last couple of years, still expect these type of terms, right? When the pricing is like at a fever in particular neighborhoods, then the next thing that people start to mess with is the terms, right? So I gave that example of the buyer who Use his father's proof of funds, but all along was going to get hard money. If he would have submitted an offer with an appraisal on the financing contingency, he wouldn't have got the house. Right. But for us to even get his hard money loan, we had to be sneaky and try and get something done inside of our inspection. Contingency. If that listing agent was paying attention and sent us the notice to perform on day five or even day six then we wouldn't have had time to get the hard money done and he would have had to walk away from the home. Did he have lost it? 
Uh, not if the seller released the earnest money back to you. Inside of this inspection <laughs> contingency, no. It's a real fast, remember I said, escrow only does what they're supposed to do, right? And so if the contract says they have an inspection contingency and the seller is not releasing your buyer's deposit with your inspection contingency still in place, it's like a super fast email from a broker to broker. Like, hey, look, get, get them the money back. You know, because it's very clearly spelled out that inspection contingency is a way the deposit needs to be refunded back to the buyer. So I've never actually seen someone cancel inside of their inspection contingency, have the seller not refund it, and then have them go to arbitration and mediation. Because then the seller realistically is going to have to release that money and cover attorney fees and their fines when you lose arbitration and mediation. So I have a question. What yeah. is a hard money loan again? A hard money loan is a loan from a private lender. So it's a non-conventional loan. So let's talk about uh, this Walgreens that I hope is opening escrow while I'm teaching. Right? So this is a property in Stockton. And that seller is going to be doing a 1031 exchange. Okay. What do we know about exchanges? It's he's got to buy something of equal or greater value. Okay. Here's what I want you guys to remember when someone says it's of like kind. And okay? that you'll see that like of like kind, a similar property or something. The property does not need to be similar. Okay. Of like kind in the IRS's eyes is a real a piece of real estate held for investment purposes. So it could be, I've helped people sell farms and buy wineries, sell a winery and buy an industrial building, sell a multifamily building and go buy raw land somewhere. There's no discrepancy. It does not, you don't have to sell a single family rental and buy a single family rental, right? There are rules about what kind of rentals you can buy in some places you can't be an Airbnb. You know, people always want to sell a rental and go get a second home. You can do that, but there are limitations and restrictions. It's like, but it just is when it's of like kind, the IRS just needs it to be property held for investment purposes. And then you're going to take all, all of the proceeds and purchase something typically of greater or equal or greater or equal value also for investment purposes. Okay. And that's it. There's not like a bunch of other specific things in there. So like there's a there's some gray area there about is this being held for an investment or not. What people will run into is when they're trying to purchase second homes, they'll put their daughter, their son, or someone on the lease. And you're like, oh, this is like a sneaky way to do it. You can lease in 1031 exchange property to family members, but they've got to pay market rates, rent. So my mom and dad can't sell an office building, go buy a house in Palm Springs and lease it out to me for a dollar. The IRS is gonna come call. Okay, so it's 1031 exchange. So for this guy, right, this seller, he wants to sell his Walgreens to my buyer and he's going to then go into his 1031 exchange, right? He's gonna have 45 days to identify and three properties. So let's say we close January 1st. So you're representing the buyer? It's the buyer. And we're, and we're gonna just run through all these terms for this deal because it's like, I did it this morning. So January 1st, so by February 15th, This seller is going to have to tell the IRS on a form, okay, I'm, I sold my Walgreens and now I'm going to buy this Chick-fil-A in Orange County, or I'm going to buy this gas station in Austin, Texas, or I'm going to buy this office building in Miami Beach. You've got to identify the addresses to the IRS on this form. Okay? It's an actual form where you literally identify them. You have another 135 days after to close. 
This is the most important one for sure. Right? Because this is plenty of time to close on one of those properties we picked. Right? But this is a short window. This property is $9 million. Like you don't really want to miss this window with your $9 million. The market's getting a little weird. Right? So we submitted an offer at list price, $9 million and 50, right? Which is not the highest price anyone's ever paid for Walgreens in that in those neighborhoods, right? But my buyer is all cash. So we said, hey, we'll take it from you. $9 million, all cash. We need. 45 days for our due diligence, which is an inspection contingency. We have no appraisal contingency, no financing contingency. We don't have an appraisal or financing contingency because we're buying it cash. If you, if you see all cash on there and it's not a quick close or anything like that, like I got another, I got an offer for this one. Uh, we got an all cash offer with a 30 day close and a 10 day inspection. Well, why do they need 20 days after the inspection contingency is supposed to be up? Because he's trying to use a hard money loan. Well, we're we're going to get to that in a second. For this even, one, even though he wrote all cash, even though he wrote all cash, there are a lot of buyers that will say it's an all cash offer, but it's not actual cash that they plan on using, right? Really sophisticated large companies, like Thomas James Homes, will say, "Where the buyer may get a loan, it's an all-cash offer, but we may get a loan, and but we don't need an appraisal or financing contingency." But if they had the close cash; they got it. They don't want to; they prefer to get a loan. Right? But they're submitting an offer and opening escrow, all cash. So then, if you're on this side, you better see bless you. You better yeah. see. Like in your proof of funds, you better see all the cash that's required, right? So what if our family buying a $2 million home just shows us proof of funds for $150,000? That's, that's not going to work. It's all cash. Could that work for a loan? Yeah. Maybe. Probably not on a $2 million property, $150,000 down. This is tough. But if they're pre-approved or they've got some other relationship or means to come up with this additional 1.85 million dollars great but prove it to me let let me see it if you're on the buy side you want to get in there with as little information as you possibly can what do we think is going to happen to my request for repairs if i ask for a hundred grand back on a two million dollar home and i show my proof of funds for 20 million dollars they're probably going to tell me like tough luck you're not, you're not going to get as much in your request for repairs out of me because we know you're so rich. You know someone's just scraping by, the appraisal comes in a little bit low, and they're probably going to try and get, they'll probably get a little bit more money in their request for repairs. But for this one in particular, this guy's going to exchange. So these are his timelines, right? So we submitted 9 million, all cash, 45 days, our inspection contingency, no appraisal, no finance. Okay. So this is our offer one. This is the buyer offer. The seller came back to us. Nine million, all cash. We'll pay your full list price. We need 45 days to do our due diligence. The buyer came back and said, nine million fifty. A little rude. Is above list price. And he said, okay, all cash, cool. 45 days, no, you get 21 days. Great, no appraisal, no financing contingency. That's all fine. But we also want to. 30 day options to extend. The escrow? Yeah. Why is that? I'm about to tell you. Does anyone else know why? Well, just backing up the question. So, 
So it's the asking price is nine million. They're coming back over asking. Twenty-one days to tender. So from forty-five days. So they countered. They countered this. Consumer short close. What the hell, right? So here's where they came back. Nine point oh five million. Right. Okay, whatever. All cash, they're like, sure, right? Nope, not 45 days, 21 days. Okay, cool. We're cool and cool on this. Who's asking for the two 30 days? Oh. The, the seller is now added in this. I should say is two. They're buying time for their next one. Right. So this clock on the exchange only starts ticking when it closes. It, it has nothing to do with when you're non contingent or how much the money is or whatever, right? So the seller who's nervous about these 45 days, which this guy's not, you don't believe so, right? He's a very sophisticated seller. He runs a private equity firm. He's probably exchanged a trillion dollars, and I'm not kidding. Probably a trillion dollars for the least. So he's not worried about this timeline. But we're we're talking to our client, and the client's like, what the hell is this? One, right? Two, 21 day inspection. What is that about? Why do we think he's countering back at 21 days? He's a big sophisticated seller. We know that it's going to take us probably 30 days to get our survey done and our appraisal reports done, right? That's so like, we can't waive our inspection contingency before we get our reports back. Why is this guy, why would he do this? Yeah? Uh, is that typical for uh, Walgreens to have a 45 day inspection? No, um, I would say 45 days right now is standard for like a higher price point okay. property because you, two things that happen in commercial that don't really happen in residential, sometimes they happen in residential, but you're always going to get an environmental report. And it's not my NHD. It's actually like a soil report. And they're testing to see if the soil is okay for development. The second thing is that you're going to get a survey done, which is very common if you're doing residential development, right? <laughs> the survey is the guys, you can see the guys in the flashy vest that just stand out in the middle of the street. With, Thing, the camera, and he's got like somebody down there and they're looking and they're trying to see what they're doing is measuring from these city landmarks to tell you exactly where the lot is. So you have a dispute with your neighbor, the neighbor says, my fence is, my fence is there and you think it should be here. And it's like, now we're arguing about property lines. A sur survey is gonna solve that. And charge you fifteen hundred. About fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. And when are you going to look at the county records to see? Uh, but does the county record tell you it's there or there? <clears throat> Maybe a number would be able to. What? Where it is? Yeah. No. You can't. You can't look on the ground and go. This is this APN and this is that. APN. See what I mean? So like when you say like yeah, there's a fence, there's a wall here. More times than not, that's probably on the property. But if you need to solve it or figure it out, the survey is going to tell you exactly where the property lines are. But someone has to come out and do that. There are maps and programs that you can use, like title program or like land vision. There's a bunch of different programs where there's a map on top of it. And you can say, like, yeah, but it's in exact science. You want to know exactly where it is? You got to use the survey. So you got to, that's the only way to do, actually get someone out and they market they'll knock something into the ground or the spray paint it or whatever they'll say this is where it is so 45 days we ask for like eh, it's probably 30 is standard right but why did they come back and say 21 days maybe because they know that they're gonna find things no not not that like we know that this is like a good Walgreens and it's in a good spot when it's a nine million dollar property and it's built 20 years ago they figured it out you know what I mean you know, something from like the 30s or the 40s, some of these hillside properties, like we have no idea if that house is supposed to be where that's supposed to be. But for a property this size, they just did this because they want a little bit of leverage. They're asking us for $9 million. That's where they put it out on the open market. 
right? And we said, we'll pay your nine million. And like, yeah, we know it's a little long, but like, you know, give it to us. No pairs of no financing, we're all cash, let's go. So they put this in. We know they're comfortable accepting nine million because it's been sitting on the market for a little bit, right? And we know that they know this should be 30 days. But they put it at 21 days in their counter so that it would feel like we're going to do this give and take a little bit, right? So because we're isolating these objections, oh, okay. right? So I've, I use the word tie down a couple times. Like basically what we're trying to do is funnel all of the opportunities into this little contract. And then escrow is going to get the contract and everyone's supposed to follow it. They did this. They asked us for 21 days here instead of just counting this to the standard 30 because they want this. Not because he's nervous for his ability to meet this timeline, but because he thinks the market's going to go like that. So if the market's going to go like this and he's looking at, hey, I'm going to sell my $9 million property and go buy a $20 million property. If he can get these timelines later, but still know that we're going to be buying it at $9 million. He might get us into escrow on November 15th. And then by January 1st, it's actually worth 8.9. Right? It might be worth less in a recession. So if he thinks the market's going to do that, what does he want to do? He wants to lock us in at $9 million and then go shopping down here. Right? He's going to go buy his 20 million. He's going to sell to us for 9 million, just the same. He's going to go buy his 20 million dollar property for 16 million. That's why he wants this time. Right? This guy's financing is not a problem. It doesn't matter. He could probably, like, it's crazy. So we know he only countered us on this so that they could ask for that. And if they just take this, he doesn't get to play this prospective ride down the hill and then buy something down here game that he wants right what you're going to answer like okay we'll do like nine million 30 day and due to, to 30 days. so 30 optional our counter came back i don't know if anyone can see this anymore they can't so here's what we said no nine million the guy's name is jason hernandez and i said nine million bro i said it like that bro <laughs> Nine million, bro. We're still all cash. Yeah, great. We don't need to talk about this anymore. This is going to be 30. You know, we need 30 days. Don't send me some crap 21 days, three weeks. Like, what is this? You know, you know, we need 30 days. 30 days is what we need, right? My clients need nine, 30 days. Some people don't. Some people would be comfortable closing without environmental or whatever. But these are first time triple net buyers. There's a lot of money. That we're dealing with it's a 40 million dollar exchange this is the first of their properties so we can't let it go squirrel you know we're not going to mess with this a little bit it's going to be 30 days we need all the third party reports back okay appraisal and financing great and we said no one 30 day option to extend what do you think they said about our nine million okay. yeah sure great no problem whatever okay what did they say about this yeah sure cool yeah fine okay and then we get down here and he goes oh we really wanted two really yeah, yeah. really need to get two and we said one so then his counter comes back nine million good so now we're just down to this okay what do we one to 30 days one option to extend the close of escrow by 30 days. Okay, and the second one is like two, which means like 60 day, right? Yeah. Like two times. 30. But different, what's the difference between one 60 day option and two 30 day options? Yeah, the refining You have to, you extend it again, you push it back another 30 days. Instead of just agreeing to push it back one 60 day. We would never agree to a 60 day option. Yeah. We'd never agree to that. The clients are, already uncomfortable and freaking out about this exchange, right? So like just saying, hey, we're not contingent, he'll close in some day or time or whenever we want, right? But whether you're working with buyers or sellers, 
isolating these objections and starting to cross the, okay, now cool, we're good on purchase price, cool. We're good on our inspection contingency, great. We all agree to this, right? We're good on the appraisal, we're fine. We're all cash, here's our big proof of funds with our accommodator, right? We're ready to go. But like 230 days doesn't work for us. Does 130 day work for you? And they said, how about 15. How about two 30 day options with the second option at full rent? Because if we're in escrow for forever, who's collecting the rent all the time? They collect the rent. Seller is, still owns it. Still the seller's Walgreens, right? So I said, how about instead of just one 30 day option, because our guy wants to do this, right? We give you the two 30 day options, but if we take the second one, we'll give you 50K. So it's a triple mm -hmm. We'll get, we'll pass through the rent from the client, from the tenant to you. And so now this is where we're at. We're on to this, like, because we used to say, hey, no, no extensions. We don't want extensions escrow. Client's only comfortable with one. And now they're tying us down saying, well, why, why is that? Why are you only comfortable with two? We're like, well, we need, we, we want to collect the money. We got $9 million just sitting in this accommodator account. He goes, oh, okay, cool. It's just about the money. Here's 50 grand if we take the second. And now our buyer is like, man, well, we did tell them it was just about the money. And like, they're offering to give us the money if they take the second one. Like, oh, what are we going to do here? And this is where we are. We're, we're kind of stuck here because the buyer just wants to close. This $50,000 is not going to put them at ease and ease their nerves. So actually, this isn't where we're stuck. This is seller count 50K with the second one at full rent this is the seller counter offer. Let's see, they did one, two. two. And then guess what we're sending back? Buyer counter offer two, which is now the, we sent an offer, that's one. They sent it back, that's two. We countered it, there's three. They countered again, four. We're sending back the fifth version of this, which is now we're saying, all right, we'll take the 50K, but you're on the hook for all of our capital gains and our tax liability. If for some reason we don't close as a result of your selling. Can we repeat it one more time? We said, we'll take the 50 grand, but also, the seller is going to be responsible for any of our capital gains in our exchange if the property doesn't close as a result of the seller. Because remember what the client, and this is like, I covered this a lot, when clients say something, but actually like what they're trying to tell you is something different, you know? Like, hey wife, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't care. Like, uh, you do care. And the way you said that to me should make me think I'm in trouble for something. You know what I mean? There's a, the best brokers and agents can read subtext when you're communicating with clients or with other agents and turn those into actual terms on paper, right? So let's think of like a more common example. You show up to an open house, right? You look down at the, at the piece of paper because you're a good agent, you're doing all your due diligence. And you look in, there's like four pages of names. It's the first weekend that this open house is, is open, right? It's the first weekend it's available. And you're like, man, this, this literally looks like a hundred people have been through here. It's only been an open house for an hour and a half, right? And you talk to the listing agent and they say like, hey, yeah, you know, it's been, it's been pretty good feedback. You know, pretty, it's been pretty busy. You're like, I don't trust you. Right? The way that you're saying that to me and this information I have like makes me feel like you got a bunch of buyers for yourself. And then I say, well, when are you, you know, when are you presenting offers to the seller? And they go, oh, you know, just as, as they come in, you know, whenever. I'm like, what do we think this person's actually saying? Like, 
and I don't care if you get it or not. I've probably got my own buyer or there's been so many offers or whatever that like maybe I'm already pitching something behind the scenes. So just like when we got this first counter back, try to think at every interaction that you're having with your clients or with the other party, like what am I picking up? Like what am I supposed to gather from this the information? And how can I take these this information and put it into terms to put my clients in a better position, right? So we told them we just want the money, but what my client said, right, was that like we're nervous, and I said they're nervous about the exchange. So what he's telling me is I need assurances on paper that this guy's going to close. He didn't say I want money back. The client says he's nervous. We know really what he's worried about is the seller just extending, 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 and we never actually close. Right? That's what the client's worried about. So we papered this to say, we'll take this. Yeah, we'll take your 50K. You can have to, um, if you take the second one, it is 50 grand, so we'll actually get some money back. But really what our buyer's worried about is you guys just not performing. He's not worried about this nine or 950 or 30 or 35 or 25 or 30, like all these little things. What, he, what he, my client needs is to know that we're gonna close, right? And so he didn't say, hey, John, um, why don't you guys draft into the contract uh, a stipulation that the seller is going to be responsible for capital gains if uh, the seller doesn't perform? Like the clients don't know that, right? Like, so that's why you got to really, really get in here and see what is most important for these people, right? What can I give the other side in exchange for something back? Right? People refer to that as like brokering, negotiating, you know? And if you know what levers you can push and pull on because you're comfortable with the contracts and the language, then you can become like a master negotiator. Because now we put this little paragraph in there that says, yeah, fine, okay? If you're actually gonna close and you're not worried about it, then why don't you assume all the responsibility as a result of you not closing? What do you think they're gonna say back? Never mind, forget it. We'll just do one, one 30 day option. Because they, they said, what's the problem? We said, oh, maybe money. Money is the problem. They said, right here, here's the money. And then we said, well, actually, our problem is that we need to know you're going to close. So I think they're going to come back and take this. So that's like a crazy, crazy example. But it doesn't, I use it as an example because it's today, but really because just the price is not, more times than not, is not the actual thing. Right? Things being too expensive is not a reason why people don't buy things. People buy stuff they can't afford all the time. All the time, people buy stuff they can't afford. Right? It's a measure of value for them, right? And understanding what it's worth to them and, and what's most important is how you listen do a good job listening and then actually make sure that it gets in the contract for your client. Okay. Any questions about just all this that we kind of went through so quick? Yeah, so you say like you don't want to, to do that and two times, 30 days because you're afraid they will not perform and it will not. So, what's the buyer, what's the seller option to get out of the deal? If you're already in escrow, like how can you come out of the deal, even if you do this extension? Stuff happens. You could get the seller could get sued. The seller could go through a divorce. My wife is going to put a lien on all the properties. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that can go on where the sellers does not end up actually performing. Okay. Right? Maybe the seller has something with their loan, right? Like if the bank's in first position, the bank has a lien on the property, and something about the bank's terms, maybe the bank becomes insolvent and someone else buys it. And they have stipulations for you to sell it. It's just things can come up. Oh, you know. Also, like there's a triple net property, which is supposed to be like the lowest maintenance type of investment that any real estate person can make. But does my buyer want to close if like there's a tornado in Stockton that like rips apart the building? Walgreens still needs to pay us the rent and his insurance, but like, do we? Is that do we want to buy that? No. Okay, so there's one. 
quick question. Yeah. You mentioned that um, if the body wanted to extend that they have to tell you the time span of the week. Have you ever been in such a situation? What was that process like? Um yes. So you mean where this where the buy where the seller will assume the exchange liability for not performing? Right. Yeah. Um I sold a portfolio of quick service restaurants, which are Long John's, um, Taco Bells, and KFCs in Puerto Rico. In 2016, we sold 24 of them. And if you were paying attention at that time, there was a massive hurricane. And it was like, we opened Nesco, and I think it was like five days later, the front page of the Wall Street Journal, Puerto Rico underwater. I remember. Yeah. So we had all those restaurants in escrow. And as part of performing in these triple net properties, the seller was responsible for roof and structure, which means like the tenant's supposed to handle all the HVAC and everything else, but sellers and some of them, in the Long John Silvers, I think, was responsible for roof and structure. So instantly our seller was in default in escrow because we couldn't maintain that. So it was like, they ended up getting like all settled and figured out. They What we ended up doing was like delaying escrow until all the properties were built. And there was like money still going back and forth and escrow was like two very large institutions. But sometimes it happens like, it happened in COVID, sellers would go into escrow and then you know what they would do? Buyers would go non contingent and sellers wouldn't move. They just stay there. So then what? You got to sue them. They're in LA City. You can't, still can't kick them out. It's like crazy stuff happens outside of contingency timelines. There's an expression in real estate time kills deals, and it does. You're working with buyers, get them going fast. If you're working with sellers, get them motivated and get it on the market fast. Right? Just time allows for opportunities and things to happen. So, in a lot of properties where they're non-contingent and there's these big extended escrows. The paperwork and everything needs to get ironed out really tightly, really closely to prevent both sides from something going wrong. Like if we had a, if you put a big development deal in escrow, like I had a, a good friend sell like $200 million worth of hotels to the city of, or to LA County because the county voted that we get all this grant money to buy um, transitional housing for homeless people, you know, uh, um, people that were coming out of jail or you know, other programs. And so they went to escrow to purchase all these properties. And then along the line, the rules changed where now sellers needed to um, make some of these units wheelchair accessible or like ADA compliant. And like now the seller doesn't have the money to do that. How are we going to do this? There's just long escrows make things weird. Yeah. And and don't if you're representing buyers, don't go non-contingent until you got the whole story and you're, and you're protected. Okay. If you're representing sellers, try to get these people non-contingent as fast as you can. Okay. So um, let's talk about this other offer that we're dealing with. So this was a good offer. This is a good story. I think we're probably right there. But see, it took some like back and forth and some haggling. But the best thing that you can do when you're negotiating offers or when you're dealing with things on the spectrum is to try and isolate it down to whatever's most important. What are we? What's most important to you? You know, if um, now in, in the climate, it's like. A lot of people that are that are selling their properties want A specs. You know, they don't know where they're gonna be. If you're leaving LA, it can be tough to like sell your property in LA and go buy something in Orange County, right? You want to wait until like they're non-contingent, then you go shopping, but now you have this tight timeline and you can't get the loan until you get the money out of the property you're in, and then, then you can't write can you know competing offers because you've got to contingency that you sell your place, it's like, it, it can be weird, right? So now a lot of people are asking for lease backs. It's just like, in COVID it became super common place to say like, hey, look, if I sell my property to you, I'll sell it to you under all these terms, right? 
I'll give it to you for a little bit of a lower price. You can get a loan, you can have all the contingencies you want, but I need a 60 day lease back, right? So that I can close and then I got two months to go figure out what I'm gonna do. I can take my time to it now, right? And it's like something that's become very, very commonplace. But that's not an inspection contingency. It's not an appraisal contingency. It's not a financing contingency, right? It's just, it's something that you make part of the contract but if you're going to give a seller, if you're working with buyers and you're going to give a seller an option to lease it back for 60 days, what's your client have to do for those 60 days? What do they have to start giving to the bank when you close on the property? You got to pay the mortgage. You got to make the mortgage payment. So it's real dollars out of your client's pocket when you do a sale lease back, right? Because if they're renting somewhere, they got a mortgage somewhere else. Now they've got two mortgages. You know, your clients are selling one place, they're buying one, they're carrying two mortgages for this time. It's tough. It's real money. So push and pull on the appropriate contingencies or closing timelines or whatever for you to get there. Okay. Now let's talk about the request for repair. Oops, that's out. Because this is like the biggest thing. It's not part of that conversation that I had with our triple net guy because Walgreens is supposed to take care of all that. But this, your inspection contingency, like honestly, what it really comes down to is your request for repairs. Okay, and the big ones that you'll come across are termite. I'm gonna say moisture because we don't like to use the other M word. Okay, whoop. You don't know there's mold there. Don't call it mold. <laughs> you can say there's moisture. Okay. Moisture. What am I going to say is the fourth big one? Termite, let's go ahead and say mold. Foundation. Plumbing structure. Plumbing. With the exception of termite, maybe, I call these the big four because they're the most, these three can be the most expensive parts of a request for repair. Something wrong with the foundation could like scrap the hole off. Okay. There's moisture or mold in here. You can't, I might be able to see it in the corner. I go look up here. Like we've got a piece of tape up here in the corner. I don't know what that's about, but like you see some like, it's a little darker there in the corner and the paint's kind of weird. You know, like maybe that's where there's moisture or mold. But until we pull that drywall down, we're not going to know how bad of a problem this is or is not. Okay. Foundation, unless it's disclosed, you're probably not going to know if there's a foundation problem. But your general inspector is going to get down there and look around and see, like, is this brace for earthquake, right? It's a retrofit for earthquake. What's, what's going on here? Do we just have a bunch of rotting wood underneath the home? Or is it all concrete, steel beams, solid foundation, right? And then plumbing, figure out like, can we see, you know, when your guy comes to do the sewer inspection, shoots the line down the clean out, can you see it all the way to the street? Is it in good shape? Is it bad shape? Is there roots? Like what's going on, right? But I say like, there's these, these four make up like the big chunk of what could be cost for the clients. And 19 times out of 20, right, the buyers and sellers have a meeting in their minds, they're going to escrow. If you can square this away, 19 times out of 20, the property is going to close. So that means they've agreed on pretty much the inspection contingency. Right? This is like usually what this comes down to. 
Okay. So we've got termite, moisture, mold, foundation, plumbing. Okay, now let's get into like some of the other ones. Roof. What's another one that's going to come up a lot? It's called the HVAC. Okay. Heating. Okay. And then what else? We got termite, moisture mold, foundation, plumbing, roof, HVAC, work. How about anything else? I don't know, kitchen cabinet, stuff like that. Uh, okay, see how we kind of hit this pause here? What can be wrong with the home? What's coming up in the price repairs? Oh, termite, for sure. Termite, yeah, what's your foundation, plumbing, roofing, track, electrical? Windows, doors. Yeah, these all these little things, right? But they're small, right? And so what we're looking for, and what this is really going to come down to, right, is, is this an upgrade? or a repair. So if like one of the windows doesn't lock appropriately, you push it all the way down and it doesn't lock, is that, is it broken? Yes. Yeah, it's not functioning how it's intended to, right? Should we get, should we ask the seller for a new window? No, just fix it and, and we'll, we'll fix it. We'll, okay, we'll see it. if we can ask. No. Right? Okay. So, is this an upgrade or repair? Kitchen cabinets. I don't like these cabinets. Upgrade. Okay. Okay. So, what we're looking for in the request for repairs is how strong of a case can you make to get this stuff back to your clients, right? To get this stuff fixed, right? Here's a super popular one that is like in the last maybe five or six years totally become something that like people were saying like, no, 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 chimney. Or fireplace. You're gonna see a lot of stuff and a lot of disclosures when people say fireplace is decorative. Meaning like, we know it might not work, right? Even if it does work, we probably know it's not up to code anymore. And when you used to build homes, they put just stack up these bricks like this and build a house around it. And that's it. If you build a new home, you need a lot more things. You need ventilation, you need all this like stuff, and then you need a cap on it. There's all these things, right? Don't let your clients freak out about the chimney or the fireplace. Right? Have a conversation with the listing agent about okay. What's the deal with the fireplace? Is it in really bad shape? Is it in good shape? You said it's decorative only. Does it work? Do they use it? Right? But don't set the expectation that if in the disclosure it says it's this is for decorative purposes, that don't let your clients go back and ask for six thousand dollars on the to brace the chimney when the general inspector goes through there and says, Oh, the chimney is dangerous, it could fall over in an earthquake or whatever. So these things. You can usually get some good money back, right? And these are your main, main concerns. Are my buyers of my $2 million home going to be okay fixing the self latching thing on the one window? Yeah. Yes. Right? Okay. So here's what a bad request for repairs looks like. You got your little RR up on top, and then you got all these lines right here. Kristen does a great job of this in the class, and you guys should definitely get to this. Okay. Here's what a bad one looks like. See addendum <laughs> number one. Why are you laughing? Oh, it's getting ready. I mean, you know, what well, they're saying is we're about to, three. yeah, we're going to ask you for oh, so many things that it doesn't even fit on this. Right? So then we're going to get, and I did this like when I first started working with buyers. 
because I've told you guys before, don't counter your clients, just inform your clients and let them make decisions. Right? I've used the example of Inception before, the movie Inception, you're trying to plant the seed for an idea so that that target in the movie or so that your clients can come to this conclusion on their own. Right? It's not manipulating your clients, it's informing them. Right? But we used to do this. One, there's a scratch on the garage door. Like she said, there's birds. There's bird poop on the sidewalk. <laughs> Whatever, right? And then buried in this big long list, like 20 down here, is like, hey, um, there's mold in the baby room. Okay. These are not the same. Don't display them the same. Don't ask for them the same. Don't present them the same. Okay. Every time when I do, uh, when we get an inspection in, I said, you guys should be abstracting it for your clients. Right. If you're communicating with your client, you're sending send them something, have an opinion on whatever you're sending. So new listing hits your phone, you know, it's in their in the neighborhood they've been looking, it's in the price point they want, you got a good relationship with the agent, you're like, there's a good opportunity, right? And you just forward them the listing, you're doing such an average job, right? If you forward them the listing and say, hey, the first open house is Saturday, there's no open house scheduled for Sunday, I can get us in there on Thursday, this price per square foot is what you've been looking for, Nothing has a backyard this size under $2.25 million, right? I called the agent. He said we can get in there anytime, Wednesday morning to Thursday evening before the open house, and they're interested in taking offers. Now that's like, oh, you did some work, right? Like have an opinion about whatever you send. Them. Even if you send it to them and you think it's totally overpriced and it's ridiculous and it's not for them, say so. Or else they think you're just doing the same thing that their Redfin browser is doing for them. What is, what is your value? What's the value that you're at? Right? You don't have to promise them that you're going to find them off market deals and you're going to do all this stuff. Right? Don't get like out over your skis, so to speak, but have an opinion and break this down for them and for the listing agent in the same way that you're going to go through the inspection, right? So we get the inspection report, we find out what <laughs> everyone has to look at, what's important, what's important, right? Abstract it, crunch it down in a nice little body of an email and send it off to your clients. Hey, these are all the things that we saw are broken. The poop on the sidewalk, the valve, the water pressure valve, all these little things, and this is $100. So would that be considered a repair or upgrade? It would be considered a repair. Yeah. But you got to, if you get this for your listing from someone, what are you going to do? Like she goes, get ready. Like, what is all this crap? You know, don't ever get caught on this thing here. What you're trying to do is get your clients into the home, right? And get them as much money back or get as many things fixed as you possibly can. So Serena asked me the first time, she said, so when you go through this, right, like you you actually tell them like what's your walk away number? And I said, yes. Do you remember why I said that? Yes. Okay. Because um, they could get cluttered about like the number. Wait, let me rephrase that. No, that you're getting there though. That's really good because I just said don't do this. Yeah. So like they want the house, right? So let's stay focused on the goal. Don't get too like sidetracked on the repairs and the number for the repairs. So what number are you willing to stick with? And like not, yeah, that was terrible. you're right there. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Right. The reason that I want to get their walk away number before we really go through this is I want them to feel like they're making the decision when they're clear and they understand it. Right. When we're going back and forth, like, 
buyer, seller, counter, Walgreens, Walgreens, this, due diligence, 30 days, not 30 days, the liability, 50 grand, then people don't feel like they have an opportunity to take it all in. They can't think about it, right? This is overwhelming already. I didn't even fill this in with anything. I don't know. I hate so this. you would recommend your buyer like just invest like I don't know like 10 grand and fix it by yourself, or you will try to get discount from the original price? Depends. Good question. We're going there. So let's say on our two million dollar home, the inspector comes back and goes, there's 20 things wrong, right? Mold in the baby room is the last one on this list. Right? And there's 20 things wrong, and they go, What is this going to cost for us to fix all of this? And it's eighty thousand dollars. Shouldn't the seller be responsible for all of that? Maybe. Should they? It depends. It depends. Oh, well, yeah, I guess it depends on like the scratch on the garage. Was it, is it listed for $2 million and it's been on the market for 180 days and came in at 2.1? We better get our repair money back. <laughs> We're paying above what everyone else is willing to pay by $100,000. See what I mean? So it, it all depends, right? What if we know that this, uh, that we're the only offer? Right? We're the only person who's really submitted an offer so far. And it's a $2 million home. This is a big number for a $2 million home. There's some bathrooms in Beverly Hills that you could fix for $80,000. Right? But on a $2 million purchase price, this is a big number. So what do you think your buyers say? Well, we should, they should fix it. Shouldn't they fix it? Yeah. Perfect. Stay in the commissary, man. Do you know they only get one offer? You don't. You don't really know. So yeah, I say ask. fix it, but yeah. if it's like the scratch on the garage. So you heard your opinion, right? Yeah. On our fake home, is that they should they should pay for it? Yeah. Okay. But so the scratch, it's not that big of a deal. So maybe not the scratch on the garage. You can just paint it yourself. Or so maybe see what you're doing. Some things. some things about you are some things you think are not that important. Yeah. Scratch and garage is not at the top of your list. Right. Right. So maybe that's twenty five dollars. Should we list this on the request for repairs? No. Okay. So Serena was doing a great job until so she got nervous. Right. <laughs> You don't want your clients to get cluttered. You don't want them to lose focus of what's happening. And so what if we go, okay, clients, there are just these five or six things we go we want to go after. We're going to identify them in our request for repairs, but we send in a request for repairs with 20 things. What do you think we're doing to the sellers and the listing agents? Get them annoyed. They're going to get cluttered and annoyed, and they're going to lose focus on what's going on. Like, hey, I thought this escrow was going great. And you said, what is this shit? stuff? What is this stuff now, right? So how much of this $80,000 are we going to go for? I mean, how much are we going to go for? Yeah, 40. how much are we going to get? 40? How much? It depends. Yeah. Right? But like, probably you will be somewhere in between, right? Like, they will do some, you will come a little bit. See? So, I Ami, mean, if you don't mind me saying, culturally, like, yeah, this is going to be a, we're going to do, she, she went through this, right? Where a meat comes from, this is like, no, we're gonna, you're gonna do this, and here's what we're gonna do. Everyone's gonna go like this, and then you know what? Then we're gonna do a deal, right? What's your name again? Jade. Jade said, "Well, I, I feel like they should fix it." You see what I mean? So, like, why do you feel like they should fix it? What is more more important? You know, I mean, it's already willing to give some things away. I just away. want to make it happen. I, wants to make the deal. Happen. Yeah. I know, I guess I put myself in their position. And if I see the scratches on the garage, I would be like, oh, can you guys like maybe fix it? Yeah. I'm already buying the house. Okay. Nice. But I guess that it's not that big of a deal, though. You can eliminate that and just pay for the bigger thing. Yeah. So when I sit down and talk to my clients about what's your walk away number, what I'm getting at is like, what's the net number? here where are we feeling like you're comfortable to move forward you'd be like what do you mean comfortable to move forward we're getting this house i don't understand what you mean like before we start punching and fighting with the other side to get as much of this 
back for you as you can. I need to know where I need to end up. Because you know what most buyers want to do? Turn this thing in for 90. <laughs> and maybe we'll settle on 80. You're laughing. But when they get that, this big bright red bold letter underlined inspection, inspection report, they're going to think there's probably some more stuff back there that we don't even know about. So it ought to be 100. I've had clients against my request on a million, $1.8 million home, $120,000 was our request for repairs. They weren't my clients. My clients would have known better. So you say 120, which means they ask for like a discount, like give us this money and we will fix it? Or they asking them like, fix it and then we'll move. Perfect. Well, I found a house in San Diego a year ago in a really hot market. If you didn't offer cash, then three to four hundred thousand of us can be in the pocket. Yeah, maybe and close. This friend of mine, she didn't have all cash, but she had a good solid apartment down. So she ends up getting a house for a million five, it was on the market for a million one. Wow. And then he has a building inspection. So he came up with stuff. Including a mold issue. Yeah, there you go. And then, uh, so request the repairs from the builders. So we got 10,000, these are big developers that do, I mean, 60,000 in San Diego, mm -hmm. right? Old thing. And so uh, <coughs> we, we get this building inspector who actually works for this developer too. And he was also a painter. So he painted a lot of the windows closed. So she said, well, what how can we get the windows open? And this is before it closed this bit. So they offered ten thousand dollars for this little little thing about that too. And then it turns out after he goes into it, it's discovered there's a serious issue because then the rain came and it rained down inside the house. Because that's why the windows have been closed. And they're closing eighty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, so wow, wow. So new construction is a little bit different because that should be under warranty. Fit to finish, it. finish for it should be, oh, it's not new? For a million five, they only gave you back 10 grand. Yeah. And if you would have said 50 grand and we're walking, what would they have said? Get out of here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's just it's the it depends. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, like, it's yeah, it's a hot market. It's a hot territory. Yeah, is it pretty hot? She probably has a case. That'd be my best guess. Yeah. Right? But the clients want to go for 100. They want to sell money. Figure out what their walkway numbers because they're going to sit down and be like, you know what? It's 30,000. We don't get 30,000. We're not willing to. Buy this house. You go, okay, clients. Cool. I'm gonna say 30 grand. So, okay, cool. What I'm asking you to do is to trust me, right, in the process for how I'm gonna get as much above this $30,000, if so, as possible. What we don't wanna do, right, is just piss them off. The response that you're gonna get from sellers and their agents when you come in with a big long list and a big huge number is overwhelmingly not going to be as good for your clients as if in, you come in with something a little more reasonable, right? Which is, of course, different from person to person. Right? Things on the market too. It's top, top as well. Is it a, what's going on? And the home. What are you what are you dealing with? What what are you actually selling? What's the pool of potential purchasers for this property look like? For our $9 million Walgreens, like not a lot of people are buying that thing, right? It's a, there's reverse leverage, it's a floor cap, like that's a cash buy and that's it. And it's in Stockton and it's $9 million. Not a big long line of people ready to buy that, right? So, 
The clients say our walk away number is 30,000. You can call this whatever you want. I call it walk away. Because that's, in my mind, that's literally what's happening. The, the buyer has a unilateral ability to get out of escrow as long as we have the inspection contingency, right? You guys tell me where you walk away. It's not run away, it's not quit, right? So what's your walk away number? So you're gonna be like, well, what do you need? Okay, let us think about it. I tell everyone like, hey, we got a counter back, sleep on it. Think about it, just think about it, talk about it. And they go $30,000 and I call the listing agent and they go, hey, if you come back asking for something above 10 grand, deal's dead. What do I do? You could tell, tell it to the clients, say, hey, they said 10, they said anything above 10 grand, right? And the, and the seller's not gonna, like, seller says no deal. So this, these are our buyers. Here's the seller. So I get this feedback from the listing agent, which we don't know where the real number actually is, right? I get this number from my clients. How much am I gonna ask for in the request for repairs? 15. Well, no, they might take it. That's good. They're ready to leave. So we're at 80, $80,000 in actual repairs, says the general inspector. Right? My clients say if they don't get 30, they're gone. The listing agent says, hey, if it's more than 10, no deal. 20 doesn't get my clients there. Are they going to sign that? We're trying to be creative and find a solution. Yeah. And you will do the deal. You say, like, oh, I will pay, like, no, no, up. don't give your commission up. On the first this you say, no, it's what you say you, you did once, right? I, I do. But it's like 2000, yes. right? Yes, if it, but yeah, it was your example. On this first, on this first one, no, only if we can tie it on down. So it's, fifteen. Hold on, the buyers said, if we don't get at least thirty, we are going to walk. So I cannot submit a request for repairs less than thirty, right? You're like, but the deal's gonna die. Well, that's what she said. That's what he said. But we're not going to come in at 80. If I submit this request for repairs for $80,000, they probably won't respond. John, you always talk to the seller's agent to, to get that. 100%. I always want to know, like, how do we put this, how do we put this together? We're partners in getting these people, these two children, and we're holding their hands, right? And we're going to give them an arranged marriage. Me and the listing agent. I will always ask, like, hey, but caveat, I'll send him the inspection. Okay, here's this is what's wrong. Give me a call. I always do it over the phone. I always want them to understand that, like, I'm trying to work with them. My clients want the house, your clients want to sell. Here's an inspection report. Give me a ring. Hey, it looks like it's like 80 grand of stuff. Right, it's what the inspector said. My own opinion, maybe we're maybe it's like sixty thousand worth of work. Okay, and this is kind of how I got to the sixty thousand. I'm just reading off of the abstract that I already did for my clients. I break it down into a little paragraph for my clients. So I use that as my template to speak with the listing agent. Okay, the inspector says eighty. They you know, they're alarmist clients, they're nervous, and worried about all these things that our general inspector called out, right? I think though, like, if I can be honest, those teenagers, like, I think there's probably 60 grand worth of work, right? I don't know where their number is at, but I would guess something that, like, they're going to need to get 40. Well, the thing to the seller is, too, in my case, I the seller is in the villa. Yeah. So I say we can get them to do the repairs. Like you can problems. do that. What's the downside of having the seller do the repairs instead of credit you money at closing or take it off of the purchase price? You will the most you might do it as well. He might not do it as well. No. But then you can create a case out of that. But, but do you want to do that? Do you want to create a case out of that? Depends on how much you want the house. Depends on how much you want the house. It all depends. No transaction is the same. 
facility connected to uh, use and hot market is totally different. cheap. Uh, well, what would you do if you were the seller and you were leaving the house? If you were moving out, you're going to hire the most expensive, best person. Well, it depends. What if your buyer is a real estate attorney? You might not try to save money on the sewer line, right? You might be opening up yourself to get murdered, not like do they get down law, right? Legally speaking, right? Okay. So trying to isolate these objections, just like we did with the Walgreens, counter this, counter that, counter this, counter that. That's what we're trying to do with the request for repairs, right? But as much as possible, you want to skip to like the second count. So we didn't put the garage, when I send you over the request for repairs, a little scratch on the garage isn't in there. The bird poop on the sidewalk's not in there, right? But we are going to have a conversation about mold in the baby room, right? And it all depends. Should we expect the seller to fix the mold? Probably. If our general inspection comes back and it says there's moisture, fungus, looking things here, right? Then you're gonna go send someone back out, get it tested for your buyers, right? And they're gonna get a positive test. And the second that this positive test for mold or fungus or whatever it's called, you know, a caucus of totally something, something, like whatever that version of it is, if it comes back, now those sellers need to disclose that to any other potential buyer, just like a death, just like anything else, because that's, the fact that there's mold present in the home is for sure material. Okay. So I know we need the 30 grand. What is the mold remediation quote to clean it all up and fix it and whatever? It's 15K. And it's 15K of our 80. Right, the 60 that I kind of thought it's like, ah, it's like 60 grand repairs. The rest of this is like not really okay. It's back there, okay. Like, we don't have to do this right now. Right, there's 60,000 here, and then we need a new AC, right? And that's going to be how much? 5,000. Okay, let's just call it 5,000. We're going to say it's 5,000. Yeah, but we'll say it's 5 grand, right? Well, now we're at 20 grand. And I'm going to go back to my clients and say, okay, okay, look, here's a request for repairs. I honestly feel like there's $60,000 worth of repairs in here, right? Are you guys, are they in a position to close and just cut a check for these repairs? No. Maybe, right? Then like, then are they going to ask for it off the purchase price as credit? So what are the different ways that you can get this money back? We can have... We got a bunch of different options here, and they're all on the form. And Kristen covers this at length. But let's do it here anyway. So we can get um, a purchase price reduction. For whom? Who wants a purchase price reduction? Buyer. Yeah, but what type of buyer is going to prefer a purchase price reduction as opposed to? Yeah, a seller credit at closing is another option. What's the difference, Serena? Well, they so they reduce uh, the purchase price rather than giving you upfront money. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So because there's closing costs associated with purchasing the property. Yep. Yeah. So we can get it. We can drop our two million dollars down. So let's see. We we all just agree it's going to be fifty grand. Because I work with the listing agent and play the game, she goes back to the seller and goes, look, they're asking for 50,000, anyone else is gonna ask for it. And the, honestly, there's probably another 10 grand in there. And like their first time home buyers are nervous, market's moving, interest rates are gonna rise again in 60 days. Let's just give them their 50. We agree to this. Okay, we'll give them 50. How do they want it? Do we want it off the purchase price? What does that mean if you take it off the purchase price? Instead of one million dollar, you will pay one million euros minus fifty thousand. Yeah, fifty thousand off. So it's gonna same thing, right? I pay my closing costs that I had signed up for and everything else, and my mortgage is this much smaller. And property taxes. And my property taxes are yeah. that much smaller, <laughs> right? What's one percent 
1.25% of $50,000. That's how much property taxes you're going to save. Plus, six, six, six hundred twenty-five bucks a year is what you will save them. If we take it off the purchase price, we'll save fifty bucks a month in property taxes. But if there's a real sixty thousand in repairs, what happens after closing? My client's got to cut a check for sixty grand. All these vendors, deal with us. We buy the house, and then we got to do all this stuff in there. Property taxes on big properties. Or on triple net land and stuff like that is very important. 50 grand on a $2 million home, you don't want that off the purchase price. And to the seller, does this all matter if they give it to you at closing or it comes off the purchase price? No, right? So now people are talking about, ooh, seller buy down. This is like yeah. a super common thing now. Like because the interest rate's so high, the seller's gonna credit you enough money to buy your interest rate down from five and a half to four and a half, mm -hmm. six to five, here, five, five. You gotta do six seller, uh, the buyer is gonna give the seller. Nope, instead of the seller giving you money, right? So the seller could reduce the purchase price. No one really wants that, right? Um, unless it's a big purchase price, then the property tax is matter, right? It's a cash flow thing. But if we're not gonna do the purchase price, the seller's gonna give a credit at closing, they can give a credit towards closing costs, Right, or instead of giving it to the buyer, they're effectively going to give it to the lender, and the lender is going to take that money and lower their interest rate. By how much? Depends. And they have limitations. And they have limitations on buy downs, like yeah. prepayment. Buy -downs. Seller buy down. Yeah, your buyers for conventional loans almost always have the option to put more cash down to get a lower interest rate, basically buy down a lower interest rate. This is become, becoming increasingly popular as rates become increasingly higher. But you have a lot of people that just say, well, let's roll the dice, I'll refinance in two or three years when it comes back down. I want the 50 grand in cash right now, right? So we can do a purchase price reduction, we can do a seller credit at closing, the seller can make the repairs that you asked for. Okay. If they're a sophisticated developer or they're an investor or something like that, they might be willing to make more repairs because they can do it at cost instead of at retail, right? So from some of my clients, $50,000 in repairs would cost you $100,000, right? So, that's one benefit, but more times than not, you would like most clients, you don't want them making those repairs because they're not going to go get the best people who are going to do the best work. And then still, you've got to go back and reinspect it. And if there are issues, it's weird. It's just this, like, you want to avoid this as much as you can. The only reason that this really comes into play is what if. I put in our request for repairs, the mold's 15 grand. And the remediation guy sends me a quote, and it's also 15 grand. But that listing agent has another good mold person, or they Google and they find that it's not 15 grand to remediate the mold in the garage. It's not exposed into the home. That should be like six grand. Right? There are people disputing prices, right? But the, it's important for the buyer to have it done before they move in. Right, because they're moving their kids in there and they don't want they want the mold gone. But our guy says the mold's 15k, their guy says it's six grand. A lot of times the seller will say, Look, we're gonna go with our six thousand dollar person. Here's their paperwork, their insurance, their history, their website, whatever. They're reputable, they'll do the clearance stuff, they're gonna do all these things. Then, like that's a negotiating piece. Do we have to use my mold remediation guy? We use fifteen thousand and there's a six. Depends. So the request for repairs is your big push and pull moment. And if you try to make a big pull right away from the listing side, a lot of times the ultimate number you get through or the response that you get is not going to be positive. 
right? Your job is to try and get the clients in the home in the best terms possible. And if you're getting ready to negotiate and you're starting to read from a reasonable position, it's going to end up a lot better. On this house that I helped a, another agent and her clients purchase in Palos Verdes, where we asked for this $120,000 or whatever on the $1.8 million home, we didn't get a response back. Well, we did get a response back, but you know what the response was? A notice to perform. Mm -hmm. You're not a notice to perform. Oh. That was their formal response. Was, oh, she even said, hold on, Jonathan. Yeah, I've got something for you. <laughs> Email, 10 minutes. But it didn't request for repairs. Way to inspect your contingency or get out, basically. Because you know what? We did something a little ridiculous. We for 120 grand. Now, Purchase price reduction, seller credit closing, seller make the repairs, or any, think, any of the above. Do you think that instead of asking for 120, like you asked for 20, would they have given it to you? Yeah, we ended up getting 46,000. And this other agent was like, no, you can't let them ask for that. Don't let them ask for that much. So look, I agree with you, you're right. But we inform the clients about all of the options. Say, hey, listen, here's how they can respond. They can take it, right? they can counter us, or they can do literally nothing. Or they can send us a nurse to perform. If you go in with a big, big number like this, for whatever your own personal reasons are, you risk ending up on in this bucket. And that's not where we want to be. So they send us a nurse to perform. The agent I was working with actually texted in a group chat with me and the clients. I told you they wouldn't get in on accident, put it in a group oh, chat <laughs> with the buyers. Oh, oh, was, yeah. That was, that was oh, I had to yeah. unwind that a little bit. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. So then I got a call from the buyers. We want you to negotiate. Okay. Well, if you guys let me, you trust me to let me deal with this. Like, I think we can end up somewhere around 40 or 50,000. Right, but the way to get it is not like I said, it's not to go in for 120 grand and end up, end up meeting in the middle of our ridiculous request and nothing. You know, that's not how we get there. Let me make a case for the things that other buyers are going to require, right? Because when we go for when we ask for this 120,000, we got to itemize where this comes from, right? So, like, when we get a number back from the general inspector for $80,000 worth of work, and I sent him a $120,000 request for repairs, what do you think the listing agent says? Like, what is all this? We ended up putting in there something stupid like, and for future something to cover all yeah. this something, but not to be disclosed or whatever, right? It was like, that was crazy. I was happy that we ended up at 46, but the point is, is that just like any good listing agent, right, is going to abstract the inspection report, is going to break it down and understand what they can do and what they can't. On the buy side, when you're negotiating this, it's a little tough because you don't know. Do they have three other offers? You know, and the listing agent would say things to me like, well, you guys, we, we use an escalation clause just to get the property, meaning we'll pay a little bit more than everybody else up to this amount. So we got into escrow and I'm thinking like, man, this is, this counter came back. I saw how many people were there in this neighborhood. This is like a really low price per foot. This is the house that they want. So pull this act is great. We've got to get this house for them. But I, I know that there's other people ready to buy that. You know, like I'm, I just, I know that because I understood the pricing there's no, still no inventory there. We had to waive financing and approval, sent out a multiple counter, and the agent could not have cared less about like our offer or anything else. Every time I communicate with her, she'd be like, I don't know, then don't buy it. I'm like, whatever, we'll just, I got someone to back up. Like, she would say, okay, say if there was a tax offer. She said there, was, there were people in backup position. Yeah, so then she sent me the notice to perform. You know, to just like, hey, you you had better, we've got two days to come to terms, is what it says, right? Basically, right? Or else it doesn't mean the seller's gonna kick us out of escrow. 
just means they can't. Okay? But remember, like sending notice to perform is like pulling a gun on someone. It's like this is this is serious, right? Because we opened escrow and so many like nine times out of twenty, the buyer has all this unilateral right to just back out. When all the seller can do is send that, right? So like it is like a little bit of a last ditch effort. You know, you do something offensive, like ask for 120,000 on 1.8 in a hot market like that, where we know they're going to have people in backup position, they could sell it with another Saturday worth of work. Like that's too much to ask for. So I abstracted it down to these handful of things. So these are the things that are most important to them is that these couple things get fixed actually before closing, but we're willing to pay for them, right? But like, we got to fix these things before closing these other things they want money for so we ended up with this blend of a little bit of a credit back towards closing costs right seller made a couple of the repairs not the major things that needed foundation work right and then we went non-contingent and the seller allowed our vendors to go in there and make the foundation repairs which is rare Typically, sellers will not at all want someone else coming in there working on their property. But I worked with the listing agent said, get, the foundation has to get fixed before the kids get in there, right? So who's your foundation person? Who do you use? Like, oh, my person is foundation works. I said, okay, cool, can I call them? And so the sellers actually allowed us to make the repairs after we went on contingent, right? So we had all these like, we remove contingencies. If you don't, can you do this, can you do that? You give me a little bit of money here, you fix a little bit of this there, right? It's all just a push and a play, push and pull. But all they wanted us to do is go non-contingent, right? But we said, we also need you to allow us to do the repairs, but we'll use your team, right? And we'll pay for it. And we gave an increased deposit and released it to the seller. So that even if something goes wrong here, you got the deposit already, and it's more than the deposit. We were releasing 10% of the purchase price. So 180 grand, we released to them in exchange for letting us fix the foundation in escrow. So like, what's, because my clients are not moving in there without the foundation being repaired. The foundation is one of the deals I bought a house in Hilly a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And it was a heavy probate and it had a foundation issue. And my friend was well known as both of us. How could you go and uh, make an offer on a house like that? So I got five clicks on the foundation and they ranged from 4,000 to 150. Yeah, it's good. So I went into 4,000, found out the whole company reputation of Gibson. And then I had an earthquake specialist come from Hawaii to get because it was teetering on a point. Uh -huh. So your house comes down, the whole of the other things come down. That's what a good job they did. Wow. Like, that much difference. The foundation is one of the very mold it's foundation. Mold, because mold and moisture will affect your foundation in most cases. But if you get something back from the foundation person, you see, you know, like shifting or movement in a home, if you see like the front left corner of the home is like sunk down a little bit like near the driveway and then you walk through and you see like splintering and breaking and like the doorways and the framing all on the front left side of the home that, that home might be moving you don't know you don't say it right it's just like when you feel like you're avid you just say i see cracks i see moisture right i see these things right and your general inspector is going to go through there and tell you if you need to like search through it a little bit more the foundation is something that i would not even pretend to have an opinion like no we see i don't know some big beam like this there's a little wiggle in it does that matter at all is it like in the home is not safe i have no idea foundation is the one thing that i will not even have an opinion on. not even not even a little bit so moisture i've dealt with this before like a the home is shifting or sliding or the foundation needs it. I'm like, get someone else in there. If the home falls over. And it turns out that something was in the inspection report that says 
this is a this could be the case, and your insurance says, hey, you didn't disclose this to us, and now the home's not insured and it fell over, like problem. That's like worst, worst case scenario. So when you're doing the request for repairs, whichever side you're on, abstract it, shrink it down, try to identify the things that matter most. Right? In the conversation when you have this walk away spot, I do the same thing for the sellers. Your home's old as hell. You haven't taken care of it. You got a tenant in there for 10 years. This is a teardown. Like, what's your number here? They come in and ask for 200 grand. We're kicking them out of us, right? They ask for 10,000. We're probably moving forward, right? Where are you at? What's our, what's our net number need to be? Where do we need to get to so that you still sell it to these people? Before we're negotiating during the week, before they give you a seller counter or buyer counter three until you have 24 hours to respond. I don't want to have to call you eight o'clock at night. You're in the finance game and the market went like this. Now I'm calling you at 8.15 at night. Like, well, how do you want to respond? You know, we have to respond tomorrow by five. It's like, bad luck. So try and do all of the, um, I hate when people say managing expectations because that makes it sound like your, like your client's opinion is wrong, you know, and you're supposed to move them away from that. I'll never use manage expectations because if my opinion is different than the client's and they're not seeking my professional opinion, and I feel like I didn't do a good job informing them. Does that make sense? So like this particular agent on the $120,000 request credit said, we need to manage our expectations. I said, why? She's like, because they need to know that if, if we ask for 120 grand, that they're not gonna respond. I said, you don't know that. You don't know that. They might take it or they might respond. You don't know. So when you tell your client something is going to happen because you're managing their expectations and that doesn't happen, that's the worst position to be in. That's why I say my job is to inform you about this process, make you feel comfortable when we, as we go into this negotiation, right? But this is your money and it's your house and it's up to you to decide whether you want to proceed or not, right? If you ask for my opinion, I'll tell you what I think. But it's not my job to tell this husband or wife that the repairs that they think are important are unimportant. Right? Don't counter your clients. You're supposed to be an advisor, right? So think about that a little bit when you work through this. Take Kristen's class. Um, bulletproofing your escrows. I mean, we kind of like talked through that. The way to get the escrow to close is to get through the request for repairs. That's your inspection contingency, right? To help with an appraisal contingency, you can give comps to the appraiser. That's about all you can do, right? You can help the appraisal contingency in that way. If it comes back low, right, then like they probably are going to need to come in with this, some extra cash. And then if that is the case, they're probably going to ask for a little bit more help on our request for repairs. This extra cash and down payment is the same thing as extra cash to fix the home. It's cash. So don't let them get cluttered all into this idea of what's important, what's not. Get into the net number, right? You know, negotiate it all the way out. Work with the other side to get it done. Like you said, you call them? I said, oh yeah, first thing I do, send an inspection, get on the phone. This is what I'm feeling like they're going to want to ask for this. You tell me kind of where the seller's at. How can we help mitigate this? See if you can work with the other agent, the other side, to just get the first high offer and the first low counter. You know, let's, yeah, let's get this into a reasonable thing where we can kind of like do a little bit of this. I 100% do that. I do it over the phone. Do not become a keyboard warrior in this time, right? There's not the opportunity for that. If I say, hey, look, I know it's, look, give me a call. I know it's a little nuts. I know it's crazy. 120,000 is a lot, right? 
100 percent understand, right? They drew a line in the sand. You know how it is. You've been in the industry, you work with people like this before. Just give me some feedback here. Shoot me back an email telling me to jump off a bridge, right? And I'll take that and I'll take the email and I send it to the client. Like she said, jump off a bridge. So I think rather than waiting for a counter, we should resubmit something, maybe with a set in front of it. Are you guys comfortable with that? Right? The listing agent told me that like we're gonna get really bad feedback going in with this six-figure ass. So like let's just resubmit something that we think is a little bit more reasonable. But remember, I still think out of these five things that yeah, we need to fix it, but it's like six, like asking for a hundred, you run the risk of not getting a response at all. See what I mean? So I will always, always send it back. Second, I get it. It is. Boom. Haven't even seen it yet. This is what it is. Because when you turn it in, they're going to ask for it anyways. And remember what I said about when people get mad? When you surprise them. So if our inspection contingency is on day seven, we get her in there on day two, and I get it back on the third, and I wait until she says on the eighth, eighth day, why didn't you remove your inspection? I go, Here's a big laundry list of everything we asked for and a big number and all the inspection or whatever. Here, go through this on Monday night. It's not good. Thank you. Thank you. So, like, try to avoid the surprises for your clients as much as you can. Take Kristen's class on this course. The appraisal, you can show up with comps. I found that it helps or it doesn't help. Um, and then we'll maybe just tack on another. Serena, can we tack on like another little ignite maybe so I can do this one planning for your future? Sure. Okay. But that's it. That's it for this. Any okay, questions so about yeah, offers and all that other stuff? What? Literally tonight is going to be like two. I'll do like an hour, maybe like next week or something like that. And we'll just call it business planning for the future because I didn't have time to get through it today. What number is this? This is uh, 18 to 20. 17, 17, 18, and 19. It's today. Which is negotiating offers. The last three. Yeah, it's the last three. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, I need to.